Marshall's at Frost, unfortunately can't be here, so I'm standing in, I'm Frank Close in the Physics Department, and I'd like to introduce, and welcome to Oxford tonight, Frank Wilczek. Frank is the Herman Feshbach Professor at MIT, and perhaps most famously won the Nobel Prize in 2004 for his work which produced the foundations of what we now call quantum chromodynamics, the fundamental theory of the strong force that operates at the centre of atoms. And most remarkably of all, and I hope encouragement for some of the younger people here, this was the work that he did as a graduate student. The problem with this is, of course, if you get the Nobel Prize for your thesis, what do you do for an encore? And there are two ways you can proceed. One, which Frank has followed, is for 40 years to do more physics. And he has made great contributions across the swathe of theoretical physics. And in addition, has introduced the name of a well-known uh, detergent into the lexicon of particle physics, about which he may say more or not. I don't know. Also, you can take up a second career. And Frank has done that with distinction as an author, and I think it is fair today to say that he is now one of the most authoritative writers on the physical sciences uh, in the world. And his latest book, A Beautiful Question, is the theme of tonight's talk. I will just say before he begins that at the end of the talk, uh, books will be on sale and signing outside. But first, I hope uh, we hear some beautiful answers. Frank. Thank you. It's always uh, inspiring to be back in Oxford. It always reminds me of Jude the Obscure. <laughs> the question that I'd like to consider with you tonight is this one. Does the world embody beautiful ideas? It's a strange kind of question because it seems to relate to different conceptual worlds, the world of embodiment, which is the physical world, and the world of beauty and ideas, which is not the physical world. It's a conceptual world. So what does it mean uh, to embody beautiful ideas? Well, embodying beautiful ideas, if you think about it, is what artists do. They have concepts, uh, visions, creative inspirations and then they try to make uh, embodiments of them, either as physical objects or musical compositions, but taking them into the realm of physical reality and sensation. So another way of formulating our question is, is it useful to think about the world as a work of art? And if it is a work of art, is it a good one? That's the question that uh, that's the kind of question we'll be considering. Uh, there are historical episodes that are relevant in considering this, situ this um, question. At the dawn of the Renaissance, artists wanted to uh, portray the world accurately. They wanted to portray the world uh, as it's actually sensed, uh, but on a two-dimensional canvas. So that ma this made a problem that was solved by this, the art, the science, this art-inspired science of perspective. This was a great crossroads of art and science, and although the scientific revolution is usually dated a little later, to me, this was the real beginning of the scientific revolution. And it has great light to shed on important concepts that we use today and, and on our question. So let's look at it. Viewed from above and afar, train tracks run in parallels. If, if you're going on a long straight path, and they never meet. But that's not necessarily the way it looks from other perspectives, like this. So there's a natural question that arises that's at the, art, at the heart of the uh, art of perspective, which is what sorts of images 
represent the same object seen from different places, from different perspectives. This question leads to the subject known in, as perspective in art and as projective geometry in mathematics, where precise answers are supplied. The uh, central soul of the subject is that you can change the image uh, in many, you can have an image, many different images that represent the same object. And conversely, if you consider an object and consider all the different perspectives from which it might be represented, there are many changes you can do to the object without changing the totality of perspectives. For instance, if you rotate the object, the way it looks from any particular place will be different, but the totality of representations from all possible perspectives will be the same. So again, we have the possibility of change without change. Change without change, I'll show you, is the essence, or I'll show you, is the very fruitful concept, the essence of the concept of symmetry as it's used in mathematics and physics that leads to the uh, modern understanding of fundamental interactions. People find symmetry beautiful, both intellectually and artistically. We can prove this empirically. Here is something that I think uh, anyone has to like when they do it. <laughs> Remember when we looked at those train tracks, we saw that they appeared to, to uh, meet in a point on the horizon, the so-called vanishing point or point at infinity. And if we had lots of parallel to train tracks, they would all meet at one point at infinity. If we had a different set of parallel tracks going, pointing off in a different direction, they'd meet at a different point at infinity. Now consider the problem which occurs in art of trying to represent accurately what a tiled floor made of squares looks like from different perspectives if you want to draw it. There will be a horizon where all the, all the parallels meet at infinity uh, and you start with the appearance of one particular square and then the problem is to find the appearance of all the other squares on the tiled floor. And here's how you do it. So you have this original square and you have the horizon, so these points have to meet at the point at infinity for that family of parallels as these points, these lines meet at a different point at infinity on the horizon. And then the key insight that makes this construction go, that allows you to go further, is to realize that this red line, the diagonal, must be parallel to other diagonals on the tiled floor of the other squares. So we can draw the diagonal of neighboring squares by, by connecting these points to the point of infinity, at infinity, that's uh, defined by the red line. So then we have the diagonals of the neighboring squares and we have the place where the diagonals meet the side of the square. So we have one of the corners, the vertex of the square. And then we can draw through these two points uh, a side of the square that goes off and meets at infinity uh, these parallel lines. And we can draw a side of the other neighboring square that does the same thing. And then you can keep going. It's a magical thing to do. I've done it dozens of times, and each time I do it, I get a thrill. Uh, and then if you just erase all the diagonals that you used in the construction and uh, color them all the same way, blue, you get this figure, and you've created the solution to the problem of getting an accurate representation.
of a square tiled floor from an unusual perspective. This inspired enormous enthusiasm and creativity in the Renaissance. A few years later, artists such as Perugino were creating masterpieces like this, and you can just see the joy of Perugino himself rep uh, reflected in the joy of these figures that are so happy that they can be dancing on an accurate square. Uh. Okay, so now uh, we need a more, so we have a powerful idea of uh, change without change symmetry that uh, people find beautiful in artistic creation. I'd like to show you now a more ambitious form of perspective and symmetry that uh, is being explored in modern art that turns out to be at the core of our modern understanding of the fundamental forces. This is called anamorphic art or anamorphic symmetry. It's when perspective goes local. So here it's easier to uh, show than to tell exactly what it is. And here you see the idea. The idea is that if you allow yourself to include not only changing the place from which you look at something, but also allow there to be media, curved mirrors or lenses that reflect uh, your, ob your object, you find a much wider range of representations that still represent the same underlying object. So it's not just perspectives, but also in the conventional sense, but also distortions that are get allowed. A much wider class of images all represent the same thing, and you have a much larger kind of symmetry. There's a much larger class of things you might have done to your object without changing the whole range of representations. This is also the central idea of Einstein's general theory of relativity. In that case, uh, what you want to do is allow different representations of space and time that use different so-called coordinate systems that can be uh, curved meshes, uh, more complicated representations than just the rigid Euclidean uh, grid that um, is assumed in Newtonian physics. Now, to enable such curved spaces and uh, distorted representations, to represent the same space and time we live in, the same space and time that uh, we can also represent with less distortion, uh, we have to allow the possibility of an analog of curved mirrors or lenses. In that case, the medium is called the metric fluid. It encodes the distortions, the curvature of space and time, and allows us to reconstruct the same image from many, many different representations. Now, John Wheeler had a real gift for uh, representing physical concepts in poetry. And uh, he did that in the case of the black hole, where he invented the name for the black hole. Or in the case of concepts like uh, mass without mass, charge without charge, things that that among physicists are kind of buzzwords that we love to use. And his, he had a yoga, a, a two-line description of the general theory of relativity, which I'm going to correct and build on. His yoga, his original yoga, without the stars, was that space-time tells matter how to occur, to move, and Matter tells space-time how to curve. This is the essence of Einstein's description of how gravity works. Uh, space-time is bent by the presence of matter. 
and matter does its best to move according to straight lines in this curved landscape. But what is it, how exactly does space-time curve? And that's where this concept of symmetry comes in. You want to have the anamorphic possibility that many different representations of uh, the equations lead to the same consequences. And that gives you very special equations. I'll elaborate on this thought, but at, at the moment I want to keep it artistic. <clears throat> So, our theory, construction, involves choosing the objects that transform, the substances, the sorts of transformations we want to allow, and the enabling media that make those transformations uh, legitimate representations of the same underlying laws of physics. This art of theory construction deeply resembles the art of artistic creation. Here I'll show, uh, this is a representation by the artist of how he dreamed up that anamorphic art. You pick up, you decide what substance you want to represent, you want what the substances are. Uh, you, will, you choose how you want to be able to transform it and still have the same underlying object. And then you supply the materials, the media, that allow this to be transformed into that. So you specify the substances, specify how you want to allow them to look, and then you specify the enabling materials that allow them to, uh, in the, under their influence, look the way we wanted them to look. And if we demand that there are many, many, many different ways to represent the same physical situation, we get led to very specific materials and very specific uh, equations, as you'll see. For wider use, when we go beyond general relativity to describe all the other fundamental forces, we we'll want to change the yoga a little bit, refine it, because there are other things uh, that matter does besides bend space and time. And uh, a, more, a more flexible formulation that you'll see generalizes is that uh, the metric fluid tells energy momentum how to flow, so it directs one aspect of matter and energy momentum tells the metric fluid how to flow, how the metric fluid should respond, not to all, part, all features of matter, but to its amount of energy and momentum. Now, let me uh, be a little more precise about this notion of symmetry as it applies to physical law. I hope it's clear how, physical, how symmetry applies to physical objects, the, uh, the idea of uh, symmetry applied to physical law is a little more subtle and takes, uh, now it, it can use some spelling out. And a wonderful example goes back to Galileo. Galileo described an experiment that you do on a ship, it's a thought experiment, but People at the time had done this kind of thing. They were familiar with riding on ships. Uh, if you have your ship still at port, and you're in a, cab a closed cabin, and you've thoughtfully brought along some animals and fish and balls to, and a friend to throw things, you can do various experiments that show you that throwing it one way gives is as easy or as hard as throwing it the other way, that uh, the if you drip down water, it falls straight down. Uh, the sw fish swim in different directions equally well, and so forth. And Galileo's thought experiment was just to say that if your ship is moving along in calm waters at a constant velocity, 
all these statements are still true. Have the ship proceed with any speed you like, as long as the motion is uniform and not fluctuating this way and that, you'll discover not the least change in all those effects. In other words, you can make a big change in the physical situation without changing the behavior of uh, the laws of physics or the behavior of the physical world. That's symmetry as it applies to physical law. Change that might have changed the way things behaved actually doesn't. This observation of Galileo later in the 20th century, it, uh, when combined with the, the, with the uh, observation that the speed of light is constant and doesn't change in different, uh, even when you're moving or not, uh, leads to the special theory of relativity. So there's one aspect of the general, the special theory of relativity that's especially pertinent and I think is especially beautiful and visual that I'd like to share with you. It's kind of counterintuitive and it was the genius of Einstein to realize that it was possible to uh, reconcile the idea that the speed of a light beam doesn't change with the idea that you can move at constant velocity. Because if you move at constant velocity, you might think you're catching up on the light beam, or if you're moving another way, moving away from it. And that should change the perceived velocity uh, of the light beam. But according to the special theory of relativity, it doesn't. If you have a light beam and you're moving towards it, it still takes as long to arrive. If you, it's moving away, it's, uh, you don't catch up with it. If you're moving away, it takes, still takes the same amount of time to catch up. But something does change. If you have a beam of pure light that's one color and you're moving very rapidly towards it, the color shifts towards the blue end of the spectrum. And if you're moving away from it, the color changes towards the red end of the spectrum. Now, back in the 17th century, a great discovery of Newton, when he clarified the nature of color, was to show that uh, once you disperse white light into its component colors, say using a prism, that those uh, sub beams of the light uh, don't change if you do all kinds of things to them. If you reflect the red piece of the spectrum off a mirror or pass it through lenses or pass it through substances, no matter what kind of indignity you subject it to, it stays a red beam. And similarly for the other colors. And so Newton's, in Newton's description of light, light was many, many different substances, one for each color that couldn't change one into the other. Symmetry, this special theory of relativity, according to which when you move, the color of light changes, means that all these substances are really the same substance, just seen from other perspectives. And, oh, I should say what this picture is. This is a picture according to the equations of electromagnetism, which obey the theory of special relativity of a uh, light beam where, oh, you'd, of course the colors are kind of washed out, I'm afraid, in this presentation, but you can see that they're bluish over here and reddish over here. Uh, if you were, uh, if this was the source and it's moving at about seven-tenths the speed of light, uh, if it's moving towards you, you would see this color. If it's moving away from you, you'd see this color. So that's the symmetry of physical law, showing that you can, the idea and, and the power of the idea, the idea is that there are changes you can make in the state of the world that don't change the behavior of things. It's change without change. 
And the power of it is, it shows you that things you might have thought were different are actually different aspects of one underlying reality, just seen in different ways. When we've come to explore less familiar realms than light and moving on ships, uh, we have to rely not on pictures and thought experiments, but increasingly on equations. But that same symmetry, that same concept of symmetry uh, applies not only to the physical laws, but to the, the equations that describe them. Let me show you, and here we can make a really simple example that uh, captures the very essence of the idea. The only equation I'll have in this lecture, x equals y, actually there's one more equation, you'll see, x equals y, that's a, what you'd be tempted to call a very symmetric equation, it's really simple, x and y are playing the same role. And in fact, it is a symmetric according to uh, the definition that we talked about. There's a change that doesn't change it, namely if you change x into y and y into x, the look of the equation changes, just as if you look at a different ob an object from different perspective, it looks different. Or just as you look at a, if you look at a beam of light at moving different velocities, you, it looks like a different color. But the content doesn't change. X equals Y has exactly the same content as Y equals X. Whereas, if you started with a lopsided equation, and this is the other equation in the lecture, <laughs> If you stop with, start with a lopsided equation like x equals y plus 2, that shouldn't be symmetric. It's not particularly nice. It's arbitrary. What, the, what is the 2 doing there? And sure enough, if you change x into y, uh, this equation changes into y equals x plus 2, which doesn't mean the same thing at all. So it's not symmetric. <laughs> now, when we come to write down the laws of physics, we need to consider much more complex, much more uh, elaborate kinds of transformations, but the basic idea is the same. We look for equations which can be changed so that they look very different, but after that change, nevertheless, they have the same content. So in the case of objects, it was looking at it from different perspectives or really going wild and allowing ourselves to invent media that allow us to make all kinds of transformation. Uh, in the case of relativity, it was moving past things. The laws of physics don't change, uh, but although everything looks different, and uh, in the case of equations, you change the objects in the equations, but the content doesn't change. In every case, assuming symmetry, limits the possibilities and tells you uh, about what kind of images you can have how to, uh, or that the different substances, the different colors of light are actually the same kind of thing or that uh, you're not allowed to put an arbitrary 2 to mess up the equation. So assuming symmetry is a very powerful guide to getting good description, good, uh, special equations and perhaps by extension of, rel of experience in relativity, perhaps getting good the equations that describe the world. Now, to move from gravity, which is about space, or actually space and time, but basically space, uh, to uh, describing the other interactions, I have to introduce another concept. But fortunately, it's a concept for which there's an excellent metaphor, which is interesting in its own right. Uh, I'll use color as an entryway into thinking about extra dimensions. So this will prepare us for understanding the other interactions. <coughs> 
This is a picture of a great hero of physics, mostly associated with Cambridge, not Oxford. Sorry about that. This is James Clerk Maxwell. You can see sort of a smile on his face and a twinkle in his eye and a, top, and a toy in his hand. This is my favorite physicist. He's like, I've got that spirit of the inner child. And what is this toy that he has? Why is he posing for a formal portrait with this silly toy in his hand? Well, this toy is actually a very powerful scientific instrument that Maxwell used to clarify the nature of our perception of color. It's actually a top that you can spin, and it has two rings, two circular rings around the center of the top, so these spin around to make uh, little bands. And uh, when you spin it fast, because of the persistence of vision, the color that you see is a mixture of the colors of, that are uh, on the ring. And what Maxwell did in a very elaborate set of experiments extending over many years, many performed with his wife, uh, was to demonstrate in great quantitative detail that you could match any perceived color on the outside, so any kind of paper that people could send him uh, on the outside, by mixing just three colors on the inside in different proportions. So, although physically the things are very different, the colors, the, the bands that are making, the, the light, if you like, that's making uh, these colors is very different, they appear exactly the same to your eye. Uh, this is the basis of all color photography and modern computer displays. You can uh, get by uh, with three primary uh, sources of color, mixing them in different proportions, gives you any perceptible color, including, for instance, white here in this iconic figure. So when you see in your computer the option that says millions of colors, what that means is that you can mix three colors in different proportions with different intensities to get many different things that you perceive as different, but really there are just three underlying sources. We can describe this geometrically as a color cube. All the perceptible colors are in this color cube. Uh, you have different proportions of blue from nothing to bright blue, green in different proportions, and red in different proportions. And I'm sorry, it looks much better on the computer screen and, of course, in the book than it looks <laughs> here. <laughs> but. Uh, but it's a, I hope you can uh, imagine what I've described, that this is a cube, and uh, inside are represented the different perceived colors you get by mixing different amounts of blue, green, and red, and uh, you get a three-dimensional figure, every, bit of, every piece of which represents a different color, and every perceptible color is represented. Keep that in mind. And now let's think of something that seems at first sight much more mystical and in fact has inspired mystics over many centuries. The concept that there are extra dimensions. You can make jazzy pictures like this where you imagine that there are little dimensions on top of ours. For example, wouldn't it be neat if we could experience those? What would it be like? Well, we can, and in fact, we do. Remember the color cube? And now think about what you're seeing when you look at a computer screen. At every point on the computer screen, you're picking out a point in the color cube, 
where you see a color. And so you're actually seeing, right before your eyes, this extra dimensional space. If you want to look at it a little more mathematically, make it more convincing, perhaps, or more transparent. Uh, if you want, if you're a computer and you have to be told what to do, what to output, you need instructions of, about the time you're supposed to output at position X and Y, and then at position X and Y, how much red, green, and blue you're supposed to output. That's what you need to know. In this description, the RGB numbers look very much the same as the T and the X and the Y numbers. So they are playing an equal role. They are extra dimensions on top of the dimensions of space or even space-time. <coughs> So the answer to the question, what do extra dimensions look like, is that you're looking at them. And now, with that insight, we can go back to general relativity and the idea that it's fruitful to look at distortions, crazy distortions of uh, space and time and demand symmetry demand a medium that allows such distortions, we can also consider distortions of these uh, extra dimensions uh, uh, that describe properties. These properties, uncannily, are called color. I don't know if it was genius or just luck that people in the early days when they wanted to talk about these extra properties of particles call them colors, but it turns out that color is an excellent metaphor in general for uh, the driving properties of matter that are relevant to the other uh, forces of nature. So property spaces, like this property space of perceptible color, are the essence of our core theories of the electromagnetic weak and strong forces. The most familiar property space, because it's associated with the most familiar force, is uh, the property space of electric charge. So if you were a photon and you needed to know what to do, how to look at the world, what you need to know, according to Maxwell's equations, is the density of charge at every place in space and time. So photons see a one-dimensional property space. And the equations of electromagnetism have that one driving property of matter, property of substance, that uh, controls the theory. It turns out that successful theories of the other forces of nature the forces that were uh, discovered in the 20th century that govern the subatomic and, in fact, subnuclear realm, obey very similar principles when you put them in this language of property spaces and symmetry. The only difference is that instead of in electromagnetism where you have a one-dimensional property space, to describe the weak force, you need a two-dimensional property space, so two charge-like things, which, however, we can also represent as colors. And in the strong interaction, you need three. So to put it in an image, photons, or the electromagnetic force, sees a one-dimensional picture of the world one color property space. Uh, the weak interactions can be represented using two properties. So it's as if they see the world uh, without blue. They just see two colors, red and green. And, and the strong interactions see three colors, just like we do. And you get the full image of my beautiful daughter. <coughs> So we have this picture of the different forces where 
Uh, we have property spaces, like the color spaces, like the color cubes, either of one or of two or of three dimensions. And we can ask ourselves, if we want to guess symmetries, if we want to look for special equations that can describe this situation, uh, we look for ways of trans... We, we want to say have very, very large classes of transformations that represent the same thing. In the case of objects, and by analogy, general relativity, it was the shape of space or of space-time that we wanted to be able to transform. Here we want to make transformations in property spaces, in these color spaces. This introduces a new kind of art, which is much less explored, and perhaps because it leads to such bizarre images. But instead of changing the shape of things, as in anamorphic art, we can change the shape in, of their property spaces, change the shape of the color spaces, rotate those around, or mix them. So here is what it looks like if you do that sort of thing. <laughs> this is the, an, an image of a candy stall in Barcelona. And if we change red into blue and uh, green into red and red into green, I believe we've done here. No, red into blue. No, red into blue, uh, green into red, and blue into green. If we make those transformations, uh, that changes this to this, which represents the same information as the original picture, but obviously looks different, just as you can look at the same object from different perspectives. And we can also then, the generalization of, anachromic, of anamorphic art is to make changes in color which, change, which depend on the position, so to make distortions of a more general kind. So then, if we look for equations that have the same content, even though we make these drastic changes on the property spaces, we're led to very, very special equations. We need to introduce extra media, just as in the case of anamorphic art, we needed lenses or distorting mirrors. And in the case of general relativity, we needed a metric fluid to bend space and time. Here we have to introduce new fluids that uh, shift colors around. Amazingly, and this was really the foundation of everything that came later, uh, discovery by Herman Weil, that if you apply this strategy to a one-dimensional property space of, de of allowing uh, space-time dependent changes, rotations in the property space, uh, the property space there, well, I won't describe the details, we get the electromagnetic fluid as the enabling material and Maxwell's equations as the properties it has to have. So we can, we can state the yoga of QCD in very, uh, QED in very similar ways to we stated the yoga of general relativity, since the underlying ideas are so much similar. The photon fluid, or also called the electromagnetic field, tells electric charge how to flow. That is, it should move as straight as possible in the property dimension. And electric charge tells the photon fluid how to flow, namely it should flow to allow the equations to represent the same content even though you've mixed up and distorted uh, the appearance of it. If we apply that reasoning to two or three dimensional property spaces, we're led to more complex equations 
that follows the same logic. These, give, these are called the Yang-Mills equations. I like to say they're like Maxwell's equations on steroids. Because to enable this wider class of transformations, the enabling media have to be uh, more intricate, more complex, but the mathematics allows you to control it. And concretely, for instance, in the case of a three-dimensional property space, if you want to allow arbitrary distortions of the three-dimensional property space, you need, instead of one photon, you need eight different so-called colored gluons that can un sort of undo or enable the distortions. But once you introduce that fluid, what now has like eight photon-like pieces, the underlying yoga is exactly the same. The gluon fluid tells strong color charge how to move, and the strong and the color charge tells the gluon fluid how to flow. What the gluon fluid tells this, the color charges is move as straight as you can, keep your color as constant as you can, even though the background appears to be changing. And what the uh, color charges tell us to do, tell you to do is obey symmetric equations. In this way, oh, I'll leave, I'll leave the, the yoga of the weak interaction to you. It's exactly the same. In this way, we discover a common dualistic conception from which all the known fundamental interactions flow, that same yoga. And now we can circle back to our question about does the world embody beautiful ideas? Because we can compare what we find in the world to what people thought was beautiful before they knew. And we find that such dualistic understanding is something people found beautiful long before anyone knew that it governs the fundamental laws of physics. In fact, it's the essence of Chinese culture, according to uh, the yin-yang or Taiji symbol, where the yin is substance and the yang is force, and each responds to and is shaped by the other. And in fact, each contains an aspect of the other, because in the quantum mechanics, when you have waves and particles, each takes some uh, properties of the other. Building on that and comparing the world as we find it in these fundamental laws to the world that artists idealized, we find that our question has a beautiful answer. Empirically, we can go and look. What did people who were trying to embody their ideas of divine beauty come up with? Here's an example, and you see the kind of distortions that represent an underlying unity and an exuberance of color, uh, very reminiscent of the kinds of transformations we found in the anachromic art. So anachromic art and anamorphic art are somehow <coughs> things that people found inspiring and beautiful, even before they knew that they were at the heart of our accurate description, of our deepest description of nature. Another aspect of the uh, description of the world we find in, in fundamental uh, physics and the sciences that grow out of it is that from simple rules you get a tremendous wealth of results from the, these profoundly symmetric equations that act between 
simple, but that act in, uh, according to I ideal principles, um, you find the behavior of building blocks that can be made to, uh, can be shown to uh, give you all kinds of consequences like computers, biology, chemistry. <laughs> and artists, maybe. So exuberance is, aside, uh, together with symmetry, I would say the deepest thing we find from the laws of physics, that simple rules can give rise to uh, a wealth of form. Exuberance of color, as I've shown, and also uh, beauty of concepts, symmetry, this kind of duality. All of those things were things that people found beautiful in art, and they turn out to be the things that run the world. So that's a description of where we are now. Inspired by so much success, uh, we get greedy. When we try to guess new laws, we, try to, we can try to th see if the same strategies will give us that have been successful in the past uh, with creative variations will give us more. Suppose we should get unify all the forces and all the substances. Those would still, so unify our description of all those things. We'd still have two things. force and substance. And two is more than one. Is it possible that even these things are inevitable consequences of each other? That there are changes that you can make in the equations without changing the underlying laws that change the forces into substances and the substances into forces? Can we do this? Well, to accomplish that trick, it is possible, otherwise I wouldn't be leading you down this garden path. We must extend Galileo's idea that motion is something that doesn't change the, uh, the laws of physics, uh, to allow motion into new kinds of dimensions. These are called quantum dimensions. I won't attempt to describe the intricacies of quantum dimensions to you, but they're really interesting. Trust me, I've been there. It's not for the faint of heart, because all your substance changes into force, and all your force changes into substance. You get really weirded out. But it's a rewarding experience. It's an eye-opener. Because it turns out to solve a problem that uh, we very much want to solve. I mentioned the possibility of unifying all the forces. We have a three-dimensional color space and a two-dimensional color space for the strong and the weak interactions and a one-dimensional color space, property spaces. Uh, you might notice that the and I've emphasized, in fact, that the description of all those things is very similar. And it's begging you to think that actually there's a bigger property space of which all those are parts that, um, and there could be transformations among all the colors, not just separately among the strong properties or separately among the weak properties, uh, but all of them. When you carry out that idea, you find that it almost works. As we observe the strength of the strong, weak, and electromagnetic interactions in the laboratory, they appear to be quite different. The strong interaction really does seem to be stronger. But if you uh, make corrections for the fact that what we perceive naively as empty space uh, gets corrected by 
the dynamics of particle fluctuation, so-called virtual particles or vacuum polarization or zero-point motion, all these things are the same thing, or asymptotic freedom, the thing I got the Nobel Prize for, all the same thing. If you correct uh, for that distortion, the fact that the forces uh, that are fundamental as they uh, arise for the underlying particle at short distances get changed to our perception by uh, effects of quantum mechanical fluctuations. If you make corrections for those uh, and see if the, force, the underlying forces might all be equal, you find it almost works. Almost, but not quite. Now, if you want to have supersymmetry, if you want to have the equations that support this extra transformation, you need to introduce more stuff. Just as in general relativity, you needed to introduce the metric fluid, just as in the strong interactions, you needed gluons. In electromagnetism, you needed the electromagnetic field. Uh, here, you need to add more stuff. And the more stuff also fluctuates, so it makes more corrections. And look what happens. When you allow for that more stuff doing its thing at very short distances or equivalently high energies, they do come together. So you could get a unification of the forces. And gravity, even gravity, fits too. Is this a revelation or an illusion? because we don't have experiments at those extreme energies or short distances. Well, people are working very hard. You can see how they're getting tired here. <laughs> at the Large Hadron Collider, this is 20, 27 kilometers around in a gigantic circle filled with these magnets that are superconducting magnets operating at 2 degrees Kelvin. So this is the coldest region in the entire universe. In between galaxies, there's a three degree uh, heat bath of microwave background radiation. Uh, this is even colder. Uh, a lot can go wrong with all this plumbing, so that's why they're tired. But uh, thanks to the effort of these experimenters, uh, we're going to have access to the, short, the large enough energies that we can see if the supersymmetric particles that we need to complete this latest step in symmetry that our, our theories seem to be begging us to make, whether we can uh, show that that describes the world. So I've shown you quite a few ideas. Uh, I haven't been able to do justice to the logic or the beauty of all of them by any means, but I can heartily recommend to you a source for learning more. For all this in depth and much more, there's a wonderful description in this uh, book, which you can now get. And I must say, uh, the cover alone is worth the price. <laughs> you open, <laughs> And I can say this without, uh, without uh, being immodest, because I had nothing to do with designing the cover. If, if you, uh, so it's a peephole, and if you open up, you find this. It's a wonderful metaphor, I think, for the fact that we get glimpses of an inner reality from just looking at things, but then by acting on it, and looking deeper, we find wonders in splendor, in splendor exuberance uh, even more. I thank you for your attention. <clears throat> well, we've got uh, probably 10 or 12 minutes for questions from you all, before Frank does book signings outside. Who wants to jump into the higher dimension first? Yes. <laughs>
our perception of color. Should we just repeat the question? Yeah, okay. Sorry. The question is are there only three colors? There's a big difference between the physics of light and our perception of light. Our perception of light does not do justice to the full reality of what light is. So our perception of light treats it as only, it gives, gives us this three-dimensional space. But the reality is much richer. So for instance, you can make a pure yellow beam by taking a, a piece out of a spectrum from a prism, and that's physically quite a different thing than the mixture that you see here of green and, and red that also looks yellow. So physically it's extremely different, but it looks the same. Now, there are other animals that see more. Many kinds of birds and many kinds of insects see four or five colors. So they, their color cube is a hypercube, a tesseract of, extra dimension, of higher dimension. There's a creature called the mantis shrimp, which sees dozens of colors. So there's much more to the physical reality of light than, than we see. There's also, of course, infrared, ultraviolet that we're not sensitive to. There's polarization of light. So there's much more in the reality of the world of light, of electromagnetic signals arriving at our eyes than, we, than, we, than we're, our senses are able to process. I'm working on making the rest of it access, more accessible too. I, I can <laughs> confirm it does look better on here than it does on the screen. So. <laughs> yes, yeah. over there. Uh, so it actually looks better on the sides, too, I've noticed. Yeah. Sorry. Yeah. So you need a big flavor of colors of nuance, but you need it as well. In super symmetry, the new stuff you have to introduce, how many flavors are they in? Well, basically, you have to introduce for every particle that we know a super partner. So for every force particle, when you move into the extra dimension of superspace, it turns into a uh, substance particle. The technical description is that if you have a boson, it changes into a fermion. If you have a substance particle, it changes into a force particle. Fermions change into bosons. Many of the properties stay the same. That's an aspect of the symmetry. But the mass changes, according to the theory. So. Uh, these extra particles that represent the particles we know moved into superspace are heavier versions of them with many of the same properties but also dis predictable differences. Um, and those are the things that people hope to find at the LHC, or some people hope to find. I hope, to, I hope they find that. Uh, yeah. Question back there. In your earlier book, The Light of the Sphere, yes. I don't know, but I, uh, I don't remember exactly what I said, but uh, writing this book has really changed my perception of a lot of things and enriched it. Uh, I don't know if I contradict things that I said before, possibly, but I certainly have a much deeper understanding, I think, than I did before. Uh, what I'd now say well, I'm not sure what the question was. What is the question? The qu well, whether science could ever really give a, a satisfactory account of art and the Yeah, uh, no, I don't think Well, I think it's very far-fetched that science would explain that. Uh, but I, I, I think the, the sort of things that science illuminates are much more basic aspects of perception and deep themes of art, uh, such as symmetry and perspective, uh, 
So science doesn't give all of art, but it gives very specific parts. And similarly, art doesn't give all of science, but, it give, it, but the overlap is, not, is very rich and not trivial at all. That's what I would say. And, yeah. Down the front. Can you all hear that in the back? If you, combine, if you combine substance and force into one, what would you call it? I guess you'd call it source. It's spelled -E. Yes. <laughs> but you'd spell it in the American way without a U. Right. <laughs> The, the, uh, the, okay, what's the, what's the status of gravity uh, with respect? I, I talked much more about the other forces than gravity. Uh, gravity is based, well, I've described sort of what the basis of it is. It's, it's curving space and time according to anamorphic equations. Uh, so it, it has that kind of conceptual similarity to our description of the other sources, uh, other forces, but uh, the properties, it's, it's different because the, uh, the fluid you introduce has to do with space and time, not something on top of space and time that we use to describe the other forces. Uh, so the deep concepts are the same, but the details are quite different. And most strikingly, uh, gravity is much, 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 and so forth, uh, weaker than the other forces. If each of those muches was a factor of 10, I'd have to say it 41 times to make the comparison to gravity as we sense it between elementary particles at reasonable distances. But if you extrapolate the equations to much shorter distances, as I've done here, instead of being outside the known universe, gravity, which was quite difficult to plot and you can't see it anyway, uh, but if you continue, you find that gravity does, in fact, seem at least in strength to unify with the other forces. So uh, this is very tantalizing. To me, it's also evidence that we're on the right track. Uh, but you were asking about the experimental uh, uh, aspects of, uh, well, I'm not sure what you were asking exactly, but you're asking whether gravity, whether uh, individual gravitons have been detected. Unfortunately not. Uh, and that's very, very difficult unless uh, cosmology does us a big favor and produces gravitons from the early universe, uh, we're not going to be able to do that. Uh, but, uh, well, one more aspect of this is that if you have supersymmetry, then the, gravi gravity, uh, the graviton also has a supersymmetric version, which is called the gravitino, and it's not impossible that we might detect that. So that, that, would, that would move things along in a quite spectacular direction. Question in the second row? Yeah. Uh, this picture without the gravity of its red line shows up a lot in standard supersymmetry uh, text, I guess. Um, what extra assumptions need to go in for the, the red line? None. Is well, I mean, <laughs> what? It's supergravity, but that's not really, it, it, it would look the same if it were just gravity, but uh, it wouldn't look very different. This is a classical effect that doesn't really require um, the quantum mechanics. The quantum mechanical fluctu for, for the other interactions, quantum mechanics is all important. For gravity, it doesn't matter so much. I could, well, the time is limited, I, I'm happy, but there's much more <laughs> to the story, but that's, uh, that's the short version. So very, very few assumptions go into this, other than the existence of supersymmetry and sort of minimalism. We assume we have the particles we know about, 
their super symmetric partners and not very much else. That's the key assumption. Yeah. To try and maintain rotational symmetry. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, nice. one. Um, my question, I have two questions. My first question is about to what extent do you feel, because this use of colour, it's a metaphor, and, I, and I'm curious about what you think about how the role of metaphor in explaining and describing and helping us to visualise what's happening in physics. How essential are they? And then my second question, um, uh, Lewis Bohr says that physics isn't nature, it's what we can say about nature. So I wonder whether you think this um, Well, let me take the second one first. Uh, it's both. I mean, this is the actual universe. And if nothing else, I'd like everyone to take, take uh, that away, that when we, in modern physics, the thing that drives us is largely aesthetics. We're trying to make more beautiful equations more, and, and more symmetric equations. And it didn't have to work. And it doesn't always work, actually. There are loose ends all over the place that I didn't describe. But it has worked to an astonishing degree. So it's not, it's not a speculation. That's the way the things are. Okay? These concepts really, they work. Okay? So it's not, it's not uh, uh, an illusion or, or something we impose on the world. That's the way it works. Now, now you were asking earlier about metaphors. Metaphors are extremely important to science, and we need them. So it's, not, it's, it's pretty, but it's much more than that. Uh, let me go back to a very basic one. At, it, it's a, it would be hard to overstate the importance of what Descartes did when he united algebra and geometry by starting to use coordinates and put and if you think about it, that's what, 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 why is that important? It's important because it allows us to give visual representations of abstract relationships. And, once, and then, uh, that's, why is that important? Well, I think there's a good reason why that's so important and fruitful. A huge part of our brain, 20% or 50%, depending on how you count, is devoted to processing visual information. And we're really, really good at it. We can do fantastic operations in projective geometry in our head. We need to, to get around. We have to realize that looking at things from different perspectives doesn't change what they are. And we have to be able to interpret these two-dimensional images we see as things in three-dimensional space and anticipate how they might move. So we have tremendous power of visualization and ability to manipulate things in our head. So when we can put scientific concepts that are otherwise kind of bloodless and abstract into those terms, it's amazing. It's a use, tremendously useful for science. Let's just use much more of our brain and have all that power uh, brought to bear. And we desperately need more of this because when we talk about uh, abstract realms of quantum mechanics, we need to be dealing with spaces of very high dimension with all kinds of funny properties. And uh, the equations, well, the equations kind of sit there and you look at them, but if you can put them into visual language and start to play, it can be, I, I think will be and can be and has been in chemistry, for instance, an enormously fruitful thing. So, so there's a whole realm of scientific visualization, where I think artists can contribute in very important ways. We need them. We desperately need them. And you need us, too, because, because uh, well, you don't need us, but you'll do much better if you pay attention to what we're doing, to the <laughs> our, our understanding of perception, ways that it might be enhanced, that, are, that I've described, uh, and and the, and the problems that we're posing to you. Just, I mean, you should be inspired, I, maybe you are, but by the Renaissance when this wonderful uh, cross-fertilization between 
the needs of artists to, per, to do accurate representations and the mathematics and science of symmetry uh, came together beautifully and made something really wonderful. <laughs> if Frank is going to be able to sell any books and even more sign them, we'll have to call it a day now. Um, the question about science and uh, art and beauty and music and so forth, I made a remark once that it's easier to be Beethoven or Shakespeare than a theoretical physicist. <laughs> you just have to change just a couple of notes in St. Matthew Passion, you still have a wonderful piece of music. Change a couple of words in Shakespeare, as long as it's not the not in to be or not to be, but with that <laughs> exception, you still have a wonderful work of literature. Change just one or two symbols in the equations that are behind these images and they don't work. And that's the tough life of being a theorist. Frank, thank you very much for showing us what's behind the cover of your book. And I encourage people out here to go and read more. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.